Dear and precious Heavenly Father, with humbled hearts we are coming before thy throne of grace. We would like to thank you that we are here together to receive your message. Please open our hearts this morning that we can understand what the message is telling us, what your word is teaching us for our lives. Help us to take it in our hearts and in our minds and that the burden will be so heavy on our souls that we can't do no other thing than go out and bring that message to the world. We know it is the last warning message for a dying world. So please send us your spirit that we may go with the force of Elijah to bring this message out, to change our lives according to your will with your help. Be graceful with us this day. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Ellen White stated that the third angel's message is justification by faith. And bringing that in harmony with James, with the message that James chapter 2 spoke concerning righteousness, or rather works of faith and works of the flesh, we understand that a man is justified not only by faith, but by works also. A man really is justified by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And I know some have a problem in seeing whether the third angel's message is indeed justification by faith, is indeed righteousness by faith. Um, and I think that is posing a problem in us studying the themes of Daniel and the Revelation over and over again. Some uh, one, and, and I had a con conversation with someone last night, and, and um, he was sharing that view to me that many are wondering whether, the, why do we have to be dwelling on those themes over and over again? I'd like to um, put a question in your mind. You don't have to answer it, because I will answer it myself. But when we consider the angels in heaven, were they righteous beings? Definitely, they were righteous beings. The law of God was written in their heart, the law of love. The whole point of our study in, in the righteousness of Jesus Christ is that that law of righteousness will be written in our hearts. But were the angels able to, did the angels understand the mystery of iniquity as it unfolded in heaven? So as you can see, the righteousness of Jesus which was written in them um, was not able to preserve them, the, the angels that fell, because they had not a, a clear understanding of the mystery of iniquity. And I believe if they understood it, they would not have fallen. And we see the same case with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And Ellen White says in the statement which is on the screen at the moment, she says, all need wisdom carefully to search out the mystery of iniquity that figures so largely in the winding up of this earth's history. God's presentation of the detestable works of the inhabitants of the ruling powers of the world who bind themselves into secret societies and conf confederacies, not honoring the law of God, should enable the people who have the light of truth to keep clear of all these evils. More and more will, will all false religionists of the world manifest the evil doings for there are but two parties, those who keep the commandments of God and those who war against God's holy law. It is important to understand the mystery of iniquity as it's unfolding, that we will not 
find ourselves serving Satan rather than Christ. The angels were righteous beings. Eve was a righteous being. We are fallen. 6,000 years degenerated. And yet we find that we don't need Daniel and the Revelation that reveals the mystery of iniquity as it's unfolding in these last days. Concerning the righteousness of Jesus, if you will go with me to Galatians chapter 3. In verse 14, it says that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. That the blessing of Abraham, the blessing of Abraham is the righteousness of Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit. This blessing. Or the, or, the, or the complete blessing, Jesus, in speaking on this matter concerning the revelation, the blessing, that is, Ellen White, in commenting, comment, commenting, on, commenting on that, she says, in the Great Controversy, page 341, she says that the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Says the prophet, Blessed is he that readeth, there are those who will not read, the blessing is not for them. We talk about righteousness by faith, if we talk about studying the principles of righteousness and justification and glorification and sanctification, but in practicality, we're not really willing to obey the words of Christ if we will not read the revelation and do those things which are, keep, which are written therein, for they are indeed the commandments of, of Christ. He's, he's, he's not compelling us, he's saying that we need to read and we need to keep those things which are written therein. Is this righteousness? Is this not in, in obedience to God's expressed commands? We carry on. There are those also who refuse to hear anything concerning the prophecies. The blessing is not for this class. And keep those things which are written therein. Many refuse to heed the warnings and instructions contained in the revelation. None of these can claim the blessing promise. All who ridiculed the subjects and of the prophecy and mocked at the symbols here solemnly given, all who refused to reform their lives and to prepare for the coming of the Son of Man will be unblessed. In view of the testimony of inspiration, how dare men teach the revelation, how dare men teach that the revelation is a mystery beyond the reach of, the hum of human understanding. It is a mystery revealed, a book open. The study of the revelation directs the mind to the prophecies of Daniel and both present most important instructions given to John, to men, given, to, given, sorry, given of God to men concerning events to take place at the close of this world's history. To John will open scenes of deep and thrilling interest in the experience of the church. He saw the position, dangers, conflicts, and final deliverance of the people of God. He records the closing messages which are to ripen the harvest of the earth, either as sheaves for the heavenly garner or as fagots for the fires of destruction. John actually records the message that ripens the harvest, the latter rain that ripen, ripens the harvest. She says, subjects of vast importance were revealed to him, especially for the last church, that those who should turn from error to truth might be instructed concerning the perils and conflicts before them. None need be in darkness in regard to what is coming upon the earth. Why then this widespread ignorance concerning an important part of holy writ? 
Why this general reluctance to investigate its teachings? It is the result of, of a studied effort of the Prince of Darkness to conceal from men that which reveals his deception. For this reason, Christ the Revelator, foreseeing the warfare that would be waged against the study of the Revelation, pronounced a blessing upon all who should read, hear, and observe the words of the prophecy. All who would read, hear, and observe the words of the prophecy. If indeed we understand the principles of righteousness by faith, we will be like the 144,000 who follow Christ whithersoever he goeth. And that indeed will be righteousness by faith. I want to uh, turn to Malachi. Chapter 4, verses 5 to 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the, of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers. Lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. The work of Elijah was to clear the way for the king of the east. I use this term because the revelator used it in relationship to the work of Elijah. It is not so clearly seen when you read it from Revelation 16. So if you go with me to Revelation 16, But a careful study of it will reveal Elijah's work in connection with Revelation 16. One second. Verse 10 to 12. 10 to 13, sorry. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kin. Sorry. And his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of the, of the pains of their souls, and repented not of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the waters thereof were dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. We know that the, the king of the east is Christ Jesus. And the drying up of the river Euphrates prepares the way for the, for the coming of Christ. I want you to go with me to Daniel chapter 9. And if you remember the story of Daniel 9 is that it is a continuation from Daniel 8 and, and Daniel was given a vision and he needed further clarification on, on that vision and the angel Gabriel is sent to give him understanding concerning the vision. <clears throat> he by the study of the books of Jeremiah had realized that the time that they would have spent in captivity was up and it was now time to be, to be freed to go back to the promised land. And so he inquired with prayer and supplication as to why that wasn't so. And if you will go with me to verse 23 of the chapter, at the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. 
And if you remember that this is the angel Gabriel speaking to Daniel as he's unfolding these things. And if you will drop down with me to verse 25. He says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three scores and two weeks. The streets shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. The commandment was to go forth to set Jerusalem free. Um, <coughs> if you will go with me to um, Isaiah chapter 44. Concerning Cyrus, the kings, the kings of the Medes and the Persians. It is said that, verse 28 says, That saith to Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasures, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. Verse 1 of 45 says, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have beholden, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings, to open before him the two leave gates, and the gates shall not be shut. We know that um, the drying up of the river Euphrates by Cyrus made it possible for the Medes and the Persians to conquer Babylon in 539 BC. Um, and remember that. As we read here that Cyrus was anointed by God to set Jerusalem free, to accomplish that which we just read in Daniel 9, 25. Now, if you will notice that it is Gabriel who's speaking to um, Daniel, as he um, instructed him concerning the preparation of the city. If you'll go back to, with me to Daniel chapter 9, again, preparation of the city, and you will see that in 9, the whole point of the preparation was to prepare, was for the coming of the Messiah, the Prince. Um, bear with me for a second. Verse 24 of the chapter says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an, an, an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Reading 25 again, <coughs> it says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks, and three scores and two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the walls even in troublous times. The whole purpose of the drying up of the river Euphrates was to make way for the coming of Christ. Now, I know the kings of the east does not exclude Cyrus, as Cyrus was an anointed type of Christ which came from the east and subdued Babylon to make it possible that God's people would rebuild the cities again, rebuild Jerusalem again in preparation for the coming of Messiah. But um, principally, um, the prophecy is pointing to the coming of Messiah, the Prince, who is indeed, truly, the King of the East. And we read the work of Elijah as he prepares the, the, the way for the coming of the King of the East. In TA 152, paragraph 2, we read the words of the angel, I am Gabriel, that stand up in the presence of God, show that he holds a position of high honor in the heavenly courts. 
when he came with a message to Daniel, he said, There is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael your prince. Of Gabriel, the Savior, the Savior speaks in the Revelation, saying that he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. And to John, the angel declared, I am thy fellow servant with thee and with thy brethren, the prophets. Did I read that right? I am thy fellow servant with thee and with, with thy brethren, the prophets, yes. Um, wonderful thought that the angel who stands next to, in honor to the Son of God is the one chosen to open the purposes of God to sinful men. The work of John the Baptist was foretold by the angel who visited Zechariah in the temple. Fear not, Zechariah, he said, for thy prayer is heard and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, and many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before, them, before him in the spirit and power of Elias. In John the Baptist, God raised up a messenger to prepare the way of the Lord as we see that the 2300 days, the 70, the 70 weeks, um, the drying up of the river Euphrates that made the 70 weeks possible, the, pre the preparation of the city, Jerusalem, for the coming of the Messiah Prince, that John the Baptist, the Elijah, would clear the way for the coming of the Lord. If you will um, go back with me to Revelation chapter 16. Reading verse 12 again, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the waters thereof were dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. I want to dwell on this language, and I'm not saying that um, verse 12 had its fulfillment in the time of John the Baptist, the preparing of the way for Messiah the Prince. That is obviously having its fulfillment at the end of the world. This is one of the plagues that is being brought to view here. Following this statement we read, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Remember that we read early on that all need skill, all need wisdom carefully to search out the mystery of iniquity that figures so largely in the winding up of this earth's history. As these events are unfolding on the earth, God's people should have an intelligent or intelligence concerning these things. We should understand these things that we ourselves do not find ourselves caught up as the angels in heaven and as Eve and Adam was caught up by that unfolding of the mystery of iniquity. I want to take you to Revelation chapter 8. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the se seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense 
that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. If you remember that um, pagan Rome, as Jeff was, was delineating the events yesterday, he mentioned that pagan Rome was under a time prophecy. It was to continue for a time. And that was to come to a conclusion in AD, sorry, sorry AD 330. Um, 330 AD was the end of the time prophecy of Daniel chapter 11 verse 24. If you remember prior, just before that time, just before that date, 330 AD, Constantine, the conversion of Constantine had transpired and he had set up the Sunday law within the church, 321 AD. As a result of this Sunday law, God's judgment began upon pagan Rome. Verse 8 of Revelation 8, of Revelation 8 states, and, sorry, sorry, verse 7, and the first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees were burnt up, and all the, gr the green grass was burnt up. This is beginning the judgment of pagan Rome. And four of the trumpets brought us to the church of Pergamos. The church of Pergamos is where the papacy, through the mystery of iniquity, is gaining control of the Christian church. Following this, following these four trumpets, we have the fifth and the sixth trumpet, or the first and the second woe, as it begins its judgment upon Eastern Rome. We are at the point where, where this, this slide on the screen um, can be introduced. If you will um, follow the mouse pointer, this section of hair represents Eastern Rome and the section down below following the mouse pointer represents Western Rome. Prior to, and I know that many of us are aware of the Battle of Nineveh that opened the bottomless pit to Islam, if you will turn with me to Revelation chapter 9. And I know some minds probably wondering why did we read Revelation 16 verse 12 to concern the drying up of the river Euphrates and the free unclean spirits gathering the people to a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. But remember, she, we are told that all need skill to um, trace the unfolding of the mystery of iniquity as it figures in the last days. Revelation 9 states, and the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven upon the earth, onto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And this key came about as a battle, which is known in history as the Battle of Nineveh, was fought between Rome and Persia. And I'll read that the extract from James White, the sounding of the seven trumpets, reads the, the revenge and ambition of, of um, Shoshros exhausted his kingdom. The whole city of Constantinople was, was invested and the inhabitants described with, um, sorry, described with terror the flaming signals of the European and 
Asiatic sorry, shores. In the Battle of Nineveh, which was, which was fiercely fought from daybreak to the 11th hour. Now, this is the battle that left, though the Roman, Roman armies were victorious in this battle over the Persian power, it left the Roman powers, the armies depleted. Why am I talking about this battle? Well, in Eastern Rome, the Persian power was seeking to gain control of the whole territory. And Rome also was looking to expand its borders. And th this is about the time that Islam is seen to be rising. And neither one of those power, well, in either one of those powers were more than a match for Islam. But the Battle of Nineveh left, the, left opened the door now that it made Islam the, 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 more, the more powerful and the most powerful of the three. This is considered to be the door opening, the door of the bottom spit opening that allowed this satanic power to rise and spread its darkness across the globe. However, I want to point you to a battle before that. And taken from Daniel and Revelation, page 373, we read, Constantinople was besieged for the first time after the extinction of the Western Empire by Sosros, the king of Persia. Sosros subjugated the, the, the Roman um, possession in Asia in, uh, and Africa, and the Roman Empire at, the, at that, at the Roman Empire, at that period was reduced to the walls of Constantinople with the, re, with the remnant of Greece, Italy, and Africa, and some maritime cities from Tyre to Tribizon, Tribizon, of the Asiatic, Asiatic coast. The experience of six years of, um, at length persuaded the Persian monarch to renounce the conquest of Constantinople, Constantinople and to specify the annual tribute of ransom of the Roman Empire. A thousand talents of gold, a thousand talents of silver, a thousand silk robes, a thousand horses, and a thousand virgins. Heracles subscribed to those ignominious terms. But the time and space which he obtained to collect these treasures, treasures from the poverty of, east, of the East were industriously employed in the preparation of a bold and desperate attack It is clear that Rome was subjugated by the Persian power, and he bought time by submitting to the, to the terms of, of the Persian power so that he can um, counteract this attack. It is said that Rome traveled this almost perilous journey. And I'll read to you from The Sounding of the Seven Trumpets by James White. Since the days of Scorpio and Hannibal, no bolder enterprise has been attempted than that which Herac Heracles achieved for the deliverance of the empire. He permitted the Persians to oppress for a while the provinces and to insult with impunity the capital of the East, while the Roman emperor explored his perilous way through the Black Sea and the mountains of Armenia penetrated into the heart of Persia and recalled the armies of the great king to the defense of their bleeding country. Rome traveled this journey to the back doors of the Persian power and launched its attack, which is known as the Battle of Nineveh, and conquered the Persian power. However, that left her her armies depleted, and, no, and she was not a match for Islam. The first war began with 150, began, and the torment of Rome on, by Islam, with the torment of Rome by Islam, following by the slaying of that power, which brought us to the time period of 1840. If you will go with me to 
verse 12 of, sorry, the same chapter, chapter 9. One woe is past, and that's the, that's the fifth trumpet, the first woe, which was the torment of Rome. But Islam was not, well, was not able to conquer Constantinople. One woe is past, and behold, there come, there come two woes more hereafter. And the sixth angel sounded, and I, heard a voice from, from, and, I, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels was lo for, were loose, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. And we know that, we know that um, the hour, the day, and the month, and the year brings us to the time period of, of 1840 when that power came to an end. I want to draw your attention to something that is taking place on the western side of Rome to the time period of 1798. In 1798, the papacy received its deadly wound by atheistic France. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 8, it described France says, and the dead bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Mystery Babylon the Great received her deadly wound in 1798. Now if you remember that spiritual Babylon, literal Babylon in 539 BC received her deadly wound by the Medes and the Persians. We were examining that early on as we examined Isaiah 44, 45. And the whole purpose of Babylon receiving a deadly wound was to prepare the way for the coming of the king of the east. Here we have a parallel to that taking place in 1798. Mystery Babylon the Great, Revelation 17.5, she's receiving a deadly wound by a power which is described as having two nations in her spiritually, Sodom and Egypt. If you remember that the night when, when literal Babylon fell, the children of Israel did not come out of captivity, but remained captive until three decrees later, 457 BC, when they came out on the third decree of Artaxerxes. In like manner, in 1798, Mystery Babylon, who had God's church captive spiritually, for 1,260 years, um, God's people, when she received her deadly wound in 1798, God's people still remain captive spiritually until the third decree, the third angel's message when they came out of Babylon in 1844. The 2,300 days is a central pillar that connects both Israel, ancient and modern Israel coming out of Babylon. As we realize, as we understand these parallels, we, we begin to understand some things about the powers that are repeating the history of the past. Namely, France was, was repeating the history of the Persian power. This is why she's depicted as having two nations in her that brought spiritual Babylon down in 1798. And if we think back on the battle of 539 BC, we'll realize that the Medes and the Persians ascended the throne when Babylon fell. The Medes and the Persians became the second kingdom of Bible prophecy. In like manner, in 1798, Revelation 13, 11, if you can go there with me. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. The third Persian power, United States of America, ascended the throne. If you remember that God's people came out of Babylon under the rulership of, of the Medes and the Persians. 
in like manner. God's people came out of Babylon in 1798 as the United States of America or Protestant America became the power that is. One is. Five are fallen. One is. Understanding that um, France playing the role of the second Persian power, the United States of America playing the role of the third Persian power, we understand that in 1798 there was a battle between Rome and Persia. Just as in Eastern Rome, the battle I brought to, brought to, to you view before, where Rome and Persia fought for the territory. But remember, Persia won the first, the first round. In like manner, in 1798, Persia won the first round. Remember that Rome took this perilous journey all the way to vantage point before she launched, launched her armies for the Battle of Nineveh. In like manner, <clears throat> this is what is being depicted as Revelation 13 says, I saw another beast coming up out of, his, out of the earth. Remember we looked at the woman, the woman and the beast that carrieth her. The beast was carrying the woman <coughs> to vantage ground, 1844, where she achieved a moral victory over the churches of Babylon. Then she launched her, battle, she launched her armies in 1989. 1989, we see the Battle of Nineveh being repeated. What was the Battle of Nineveh? It was a battle between Rome and Persia for the territory where Rome won the battle. In like manner, in 989, we saw that atheism brought the union of Persia and Rome, the union of the United States of America and Rome. By the, by the fact that Rome, sorry, by the fact that the United States of America had, begin the, had, had now begun the role of Clovis. Clovis, remember, um, dedicated his sword to the papacy in aid of her removing the free obstacles in her way, the Vandals, the Herali, the Ostrogoths. 989, we see the first obstacles, obstacle in the papacy's way coming down, communism, the king of the south. Remember, free obstacles in the papacy's way as she seeks to gain control of this world, the king of the south, the glorious land, Egypt. Rome, United States of America assumed her role of Clovis. So it can be safely said that Persia lost the battle for the control of the new world order. And Rome was now riding this beast. Nevertheless, the Battle of Nineveh was fought between spiritual Persia and spiritual Rome where Rome won the battle. Following that, we should see the attack of Islam as she attacked Rome after the Battle of Nineveh. And we know that since 989, Islam's activity against the United States of America has increased. Well, remember that Rome's attack were upon the armies, sorry, Islam's attack in the east under Revelation 9 were against the armies of Rome. 989, the United States of America became the armies of Rome. Islam began her torment and the process of slaying the United States of America into the one world system. That is the whole purpose of that. Amen. As we I want you to identify that, that, I want, to, I want to further bring some more, well, before I do that, I want you to identify that, or to remember that Islam was under a time prophecy that came to an end in 1840. And in 1840, I want you to Recognize the fact that the lamb-like beast was carrying the woman. And the fact that this dragon power, 
this Islamic power is coming to an end in 1840, and the fact that the nations of Europe are coming together to decide the fate of Islam, there is a union there taking place of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And there was a decision. It's a decision time. A decision time has to be made in that time period. It's a time where the foolish virgins and the wise virgins must make their choice whether they will worship the beast and his image, the dragon, the beast, and his image, or worship Christ. This is the whole issue that is taking place. So you have a miniature version taking place there of the threefold union in their work to pass themselves off as God. Remember, we read Revelation 16. If you can go with me to Revelation 16. Just to bring it, refresh your memory again concerning it. Read, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. Verse 13, sorry. I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Verse 14. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. If you drop down to verse, well, I'll read verse 15. It's vital because the, five, the wise virgins must pay heed to verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments. This he walk naked and they see his shame. Remember the man that came into the wedding, gar wedding feast who had not a wedding garment. We know that the garment is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Verse 16 says, And he gathered them together in, into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. A place of decision. A place where the people of Israel had to make a choice between whether they will worship the, at the altar of Baal or at the altar of Jehovah. And this was the issue of the time period of 1840 to 1844. The five wise, five foolish virgins had to make that decision. And we know that the five foolish virgins took their stand under the, under the worship of the altar of Baal. I want you to now Go with me to Revelation 9 as I bring this point to a conclusion. Revelation 9. In Revelation 9, verse 1, it says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Eastern Rome was now being engulfed by this darkness that was rising from the bottomless pit. I want you to um, take thought that the papal darkness in the 1260 was a reason for God withholding his spirit in that time period. It was considered to be the Dark Ages, the papal reign of supremacy. So while Islam was spreading her false doctrine, her darkness, on the globe, on Eastern Rome, papal Rome was doing it on the West, the Dark Ages. But remember that following, following this darkness, if you will go with me to verse 13 of the chapter, And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from, from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loose, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year to slay the third part of men. I want to refresh your memory on the fact, in the fact that the armies that Islam is now permitted to slay for that time period are also the armies of Rome. 
papal Rome. If you remember that Justinian is the one that made the papacy the corrector of heretics, that issued a decree that the papacy was now the corrector of heretics in Christianity or in all religions. And it's, it was by Justinian armies, or Justinian armies partake, partook in the destruction of the free horns. So the papacy was not only sitting upon the waters of the West, the ten kings of Europe, or seven kings of Europe, but she was also sitting upon the waters of the East. And if you notice that the fifth trumpet brings darkness upon these waters, and the sixth trumpet brings about a drying up of that power, drying up of that power on the East. I want you to, I want to take you to Revelation chapter 11, as another element is brought into view on the western side, which is resulting in the drying up of the waters of the, of the west. Revelation 11, verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them, and kill them. There's a beast, this beast, this atheistic France, rising from the bottomless pit, and it results, the result is the drying up of the waters of Mystery Babylon. But the whole purpose of the drying up of the waters of Mystery Babylon, as in the case of literal Babylon, was to prepare the way for the King of the East. Amen, brethren? Amen. In like manner, we observe the King in 1840 as he descended the personage of Jesus after the waters were dried up, both east and west. And the Elijah, as he prepared the people to stand in the hour when the king came to examine the guests. As we can see clearly um, how the mysteries of iniquity is unfolding to prevent the people of God from being prepared to stand in the presence of the king as he comes with the proper garment. We can see the importance of understanding those things. At this point in time, we were just, learn we're just learning the basics of the mystery of iniquity as it unfolds, but it goes deeper and deeper and deeper. And it's important for us to understand these movements at the end of the world. If you'll go with me to um, Revelation 16 again, It's not a need to read it again because I've read it, this is the third time, but just to, um, before, I, before I read it, I want you to realize something. I want to throw this point in. If you notice that the trumpets are similar to the plagues. The fifth trumpet brought darkness, and the sixth trumpet resulted in the drying up of the river Euphrates. Revelation 16, verse 10 or oh, is it verse 12? Verse 12, the six, the six, ten. ten? The fifth trumpet, that's right, I want verse 10. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness. In like manner, the fifth trumpet, the darkness that it brought. And verse 12 brings to view... Um, well, let me read it. Verse 12 says, And the sixth angel poured out his vial... On, upon the great river Euphrates, and the waters thereof were dried up. The drying up of the river Euphrates is brought to view in the plagues, and we see it's... Okay. The drying up of the river Euphrates were brought to view in, in the plagues, and we see, it's, um, we see that it's also repeating under the trumpets. The, the Euphrates River on which the woman sits. I am running out of time, and I really had plans to take this a lot further this morning. Um, okay. Uh, the whole purpose of, this, of these prophecies being repeated, Let's, let, let me carry on to um, take you to 1989, as I explained to you earlier on. 
1989 was the Battle of Nineveh, as Nineveh repeats the Battle of Nineveh on the Eastern Rome, followed by the torment and the slaying of um, the, power, the, the, the Roman armies, we should see descending at this point in time the angel of Revelation 18 Amen. as the angel of Revelation 10 descended. In the descent of this angel, it is to prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. Remember, Elijah was sent to prepare a people for the coming of the Lord. And as this angel is descending, which is the third angel's message, swelling into, this, swelling into a loud cry, its purpose is to prepare a people to stand before the king. And um, I think I will have to leave it here at this point, and I will continue um, with it next time. Shall we um, kneel for the prayer, closing prayer? Dear yeah, Father God, we thank you for being with us at this time. According to your promise, where two or three are gathered, there will you be in the midst. We thank you for this time that as you are unfolding the mysteries of Babylon or the mysteries of iniquity, which figures so largely at the end of this world, and that all need to have an intelligent understanding of it, Lord, that we thank you that though unworthy we be, Lord, you have chosen us to open these things to that we may be able to stand, that we may be able to resist the wars of the devil. We thank you, Lord, that you have called this prophecy school into, oh Lord, into this great work that is so needed in this time of Earth's history. We pray for those who are leading out in this prophecy school. We pray for Jeff as he endeavors to bring these truths that are so vital to our salvation. And we pray that your spirit will move upon the congregation, that they will cooperate, Lord, even in studying these things again and again until these themes are fully understood according to your purpose. Pray that you will be with the proceedings of today, Lord, and that your spirit will be revealed in a marked and special way in our experience. In Jesus' name, amen.